All right, welcome back to another exciting edition of Nerds Explain It All. I'm Lance. I'm Steven. I'm Nancy. And joining us today, we have two guests. We have Ace and Travis. All right. We have five of us today, and today we are talking about The Legend of Korra and the Avatar of the Last Airbender universe. I've been on the record of saying it's the best, uh, in my opinion, the best animated show that I've that I've watched. And I've watched a lot of animated things, um, and this is the, by far the best. I don't have to agree with that. Now that's high praise coming means that means it comes above Batman the animated series. Hey, right. yeah, that's true. Batman the animated series is a solid number two. Woo. That's high praise. SpongeBob. Fuck SpongeBob. What? SpongeBob is actually a pretty no, good show. SpongeBob is a great show when it's not bumping the Legend of Korra. Exactly. Ooh. Indeed. By the way, that new SpongeBob movie looks awful. Uh, I mean, it looks funny, but why do they have to go three three G three G? 3G. 3, 3G. <laughs> Why indeed? <I> <laughs> man. Crappy cell signal once they get out of the water. Man, it's taking forever to download. So let's see. Let's well. Let's quickly before we get into Cora and especially this fantastic last fourth season, especially the the finale. Uh, I guess let's give uh, some of the listeners a brief uh, overview of the universe. So Nancy, you want to uh, start us off by talking about Avatar: The Last Airbender? Okay. Well, how about I read for you? I'm not going to recite. I'm not going to lie. I had to look it up. I'm going to read for you. (laughs) I know. I'm sorry. The uh, opening monologue for Avatar The Last Airbender, which is narrated by one of the main characters, Katara. Water, earth, fire, air. My grandmother used to tell me stories about the old days, a time of peace when the Avatar kept balance between the water tribes, earth kingdom, fire nation, and air nomads. But that all changed when the fire nation attacked. Only the Avatar mastered all four elements. Only he could stop the ruthless firebenders. But when the world needed him most, he vanished. A hundred years have passed, and the Fire Nation is nearing victory in the war. Two years ago, my father and the men of my tribe journeyed to the Earth Kingdom to help fight against the Fire Nation, leaving me and my brother to look after our tribe. Some people believe that the Avatar was never reborn into the Air Nomads, and that the cycle of the Avatar is broken. But I haven't lost hope. I still believe that somehow the Avatar will return to save the world. Which it gets a little different once the series starts properly. Yep. So basically, everyone in this world, um, not everyone is a bender, or a bender is a person who can manipulate the element that they are, are born with. So either a waterbender, earthbender, firebender, airbender, um, Katara... Aang and Sokka are the main characters for most of the first season. I'm kind of fuzzy on that a little bit. Uh, I'd, say, I'd say Zuko was a main character as well. Yeah, right. Technically, Zuko was a villain. But he's a main character, though. Thank you, right. Well, yeah, the main character. You are technically correct. So, so anyway, correct. basically what happens <laughs> is Katara and her brother, the person who was narrating what I read before, do discover the Avatar. <sighs> the only problem is he's not an old man like they probably assumed he would be. He is a 12-year-old child, and he was stuck in an iceberg with his air bison, whose name is Appa, and Appa is incredible. You should look it up. (laughs) Appa is the second best character in this show. (laughs) I would agree with that. I would agree. Who's the first one? Zuko. 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 Prince of the... I'm an Eero man. I mean, I love Eero. Everybody's an Eero man, but Zuko is the best developed character on the show. So... We really can't give you a very good, like, in-depth, nor, nor should we um, spoil it, but it's enough that if you're interested in people... Everybody dies. <laughs> <laughs> if you're an air nation. Ooh, too hey. uh, Ouch. Shh. Spoiler. So, basically, the, the, the short version is, a hundred years ago, the Fire Nation attacked and uh, all the different nations... They attacked all the other nations. And killed everyone in the... Air Nation, making Aang, the the Avatar who was frozen in an iceberg, the last Airbender. Aha! Ah, so, uh, and uh, and a lot of the themes in the in the show as it progresses through the seasons are definitely him struggling with being the last of his kind, and um, and him being uh, a punk and the increasing with right. the, well, you know his duties as the Avatar as opposed to. Kid. His beliefs as a monk. Yeah, and he's yeah, still a kid as well. And, uh, and even after he masters all four elements, like you said, there are these huge conflicts that come up. That um, yeah, he's he's having a hard time doing right by his duty and his people, and 
you know, helping the people of this world by also not uh, infringing upon his beliefs, which is really interesting because that's a, a real conflict that people have all the time. It's not just a real conflict, but it's a, it's a very mature conflict for something that we, we also re- for, seem to forget sometimes that this is a kid show. That's true. You know, right. it's a Nickelodeon producer. Well, it's not really. I mean, it's not really, but, it, but it's actually well, a lot of mature it things. Was. Just because it aired on a children's network does not mean that it's only for children. That's never been yeah, really. Yeah, it's happened a whole but lot of mature themes. And, I'm and pretty sure, though. Way. So yeah, what do you think, think was it? Oh, I'm sorry, Travis. What were you, what were you I, I only think it takes one episode for you to realize, wait, this is not a kid's show. This is for adults. Um, kids may just like the pretty colors and stuff and yeah. the, the cool in and the cute characters, but... Uh, this is a deep, uh, you well, know, adult kind of You know of story. what the show is a lot like is, like, what we always gloat about is our run of cartoons in the 90s that had, you know, like your Animaniacs and your, and your Ren and Stimpy's and whatnot. There's humor in it all over the place. Oh, yeah. Uh, everybody loves Sokka. Yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, if, for the parents watching along, there's some really, really deep stuff there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. For sure. Um, and so this show, you know, it goes on for, you know, for, for three seasons. Uh, each season is a, is a book, uh, where, uh, where Aang, the main character, he learns, uh, each, uh, a, a different element that he has to master in his cycle because he's already a master airbender. So the first season, the first book, he masters water. Then in book two, he masters earth. And then finally in the third and the final, uh, mm. chapter, he masters fire. What does he, which is the hard, what does he, because it's the opposite of his personality. Yeah. yeah. What does he master? Right. So let's go. <laughs> That's what Sokka's for. Yeah, okay. he already did that during the uh, <laughs> um, Ember Island players. Wait, is, That's true. Is, is that no? Is that, that, I guess. I guess. The I spirit, could argue that he did that on the day on the uh, the day of Black Sun. Black Sun. The, well, mm-hmm. I think the spirit is the uh, is the heart. You know, because they're all, he's also they don't really ever talk about how even though it's not really another element, you have to master spirit. Well, and they made that. They made that very clear in Korra Absolutely. that Aang, the av- avatar, uh, Aang as the avatar was very spiritually inclined because he was an air nomad, and Korra, on the other hand, um, had a very hard time accessing the spirit world, yes. which was like a yeah. major plot point for a mm-hmm. while because of, probably for a lot of reasons, but also because of her personality, and she, she was just immature. Yeah. Now hold on. Let's now let's talk about the avatar and the avatar cycle a bit. Okay. Go for it. Uh, Okay, sure, I'll do it. Why not? <laughs> um, so the Avatar is is a reincarnation of a well. We eventually learn a, of a, a reincarnation of a spirit. So, um, but, but it goes in cycles and it follows the pattern of each element. So Earth, there's Earth, which correlates to the spring. There's uh, fire, which correlates to the summer. Air, which com- correlates to uh, autumn and then water, which cor- correlates to uh, winter, and so it goes. It goes in a cycle. So there's Aang, who's the an air nomad, uh, and who was the avatar. And after him would be a water, uh, uh, water bender avatar, who was Korra. And then you know after that, well, we haven't gotten to that. For, but after Korra will be an Earth. Avatar, and after that will be another fire avatar. So it goes in that cycle, and the avatar has this huge, immense power that they can tap into. They can already bend all four elements, but they have this power they can tap into called the avatar state. The problem is, if you're killed in the avatar Uh-oh. state, the cycle is broken forever. You lose your connection to all the previous avatars, which is a thing. You can mm-hmm. go back and. Um, you know, talk to your previous avatar incarnations and yeah, guidance, and, stuff like and, that. guidance yeah. and advice from them. But, you know, if you misuse it or if you have a villain that knows enough about it and try and kills you while you're in the avatar state, you're just, it's, yeah. it's gone forever. There. That's worth mentioning because it's a big plot point in many, many episodes mm. and many books. In both, in both shows, too. Yes. Yes, it says. It's kind of a big deal. <laughs> well, when did we first start liking it? I don't really remember. It's probably Sokka said something hilarious and I laughed until I cried. Well, <laughs> you know, for, but, for me, um, I was looking for a movie to watch on Netflix and I came across The Last Airbender, the horrible and Night Shyamalan 
movie. Oh, no. movie. <laughs> Everyone's like, ugh. And, yeah, uh, that was, that's seriously one of the worst things I've ever seen. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's been recorded for uh, Prosperity that I like big budget bombs. And so I was like, ah, oh, this is perfect. Oh, so I watched it, and it was awful. But I was like, I want to see more. I want to see more. And so I was like, how do I get the show? Luckily, at that time, it was available on Netflix. So I was like, let's do it. So I, so I watched all three seasons, pretty much back to back to back. And, uh, and uh, I mean, it was everything. I mean, it, it, it's a great show. Um, it's much, I think, I think it's much less mature than Legend of Korra. It's, it's, kind, uh-huh. it's kind of like, um, remember they had the, the Rugrats and they had the all grown up. Well, mm-hmm. one yes. was it was teenagers. You know, if you, ha- you have, a, you know, 10 to 12 year olds watching uh, Legend, you know, uh, Last Airbender, you know, Legend of Korra is for more for like 60 to 18 year olds, really. This well, it's for the people who, who grew up, up on exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Quickly, we'll go through the characters. A, okay, that's a, a good. A, he's the last airbender. He's been frozen in an iceberg for 100 years. You've got Katara and Sokka, brother and sisters, who are who, um, finding. Katara is a fledgling water. water bender in the Southern Water Tribe. Sokka just throws a boomerang around. Uh, on, on, it always on, comes back. On the villains, on the villain side, <laughs> you've got um, uh, Zuko and his uncle Iro. Zuko is the exiled son of the super bad guy Fire Lord Ozai, who is uh, looking for the Avatar in order to win some favor in his father's eyes. Iro is his mentor, who used to be a big general, uh, but now is uh, taking it upon his, uh, himself to. Basically, Ray Zuko. Zuko, and mm-hmm. um, that's pretty much the main characters in the first season. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's that's it. And then the, you know their journey, like it's in that first season, you're still getting to know the characters. But basically, what the main character Ang is doing, he's learning the first, uh, the other, the, the second element that he has to master uh, to fulfill his destiny, which is water. Yeah, right. And so, so he and Katara are on a journey to both find water bidding master, a uh, water bidding master to teach them both. They find it. It was the whole thing. That's it. He's in the, in the northern. They finally get to, they, they travel around a bit. They finally get to the northern water tribe, which is much more advanced and has the actual cities as opposed to the southern water tribe, which is Eskimos and just Eskimos. Kind of huts. Um, right. And, uh, and and I mean, I don't know how much we want to go into the whole that whole aspect well, of it. That's good enough. That's Not good. really, because I think we just need to say at the end of that season, Big fish. Um, another character is dispatched <laughs> to um, Z- Zuko's daughter. Uh, or, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sister is sent to capture Iroh and Zuko after they have uh, Ozai is not happy with what they've been doing. Yes. Mm. So he sends his daughter Azula, who is it's I mean, a, I'm pretty sure that she's. Fun. Even just from that sound bite that you see at the end of the, in that last episode, you're like, oh, she's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, on into book two. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so they leave the Northern Water Tribe. Um, Aang continues to learn water bending, but now he needs to find himself an earth bending teacher, and that is also pretty much the thrust of book two. Yes. And then they find they find his his water bending uh, no his, his earth bending teacher. He is instructed to uh, find somebody who waits and listens. And you are introduced to Toph, uh, who is Blind. younger than them, and uh, she is a blind earth bending master. Mm-hmm. The best earth bender in the world. It's true, and she can use her earth bending powers to see using vibrations, which is why she is the one that waits and listens. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So all during while Aang's learning earth bending from Toph, they're being chased around by Azula, who mm-hmm. was introduced at the end of the first book, and she's a fire bending prodigy. She's everything Zuko isn't. Smart, great, talented, mm-hmm. uh, you know, manipulative, all that kind of stuff. And so she's their primary antagonist through book two. And during uh, during their conflict, Zuko runs into her several times, and then they have their conflict and. He's he's uh, conflicted. Do I do you know? He's conflicted he's over what he should do. Yeah, Zuko's, his allegiance is being pulled in two different yeah, directions between versus, his, his uncle and his yeah. sister. His, right. I mean, he he really hasn't you know strayed over to the help of the Avatar uh, no. side yet. But he is between. Well, at what point did he get the uh, combustion man? Combustion man was introduced. Oh, that's a good question. I think in was it book three. I think no, it's no, book, it was book two. 
I guess so. No, it, it, was, no, it was book three because it's after he. Was it? He, he, yeah, it's it was book three. It's after Aang, Aang wakes up from like Azula nearly frying him to death. Yeah. Mm. Okay. It was the very beginning of book three because Zuko was paid him uh, while he was back in the fire station. Yeah, because he has to. Yeah, because he atones for that later. And maybe we should also mention that during this whole time that the, that we're traveling with the with the Avatar and his friends. Um, throughout the rest of the story, Fire Lord Ozai is mounting like massive, massive attacks against the other nations. He really so, wants world domination. So the so also the other t- the other na- the water tribes kind of kaput. Um, the obviously the air nomads are, are no more, and you, you ain't got to worry about the Fire Nation because that's who that's your people. So the b- last big holdout is the Earth Kingdom and the major city of Ba Sing Se. And that's the Fire Nation's last. And that when Katara says, you know, the Fire Nation is on the verge of ending the war, if they can capture and conquer Ba Sing Se, which they do, then the war ends. Yep, yeah, and which so, happens at the mm-hmm. end of season two. Right. right. Yeah. So that leaves us uh, in the, into the book three, season three, where we're learning about fire. fire. And in this one, it's very much um, more than the first. Um, Two seasons, the Team Avatar. I don't think they're called. Are they called that? In the, the they are. Yeah. Well, the Team Avatar the is over Ang squad. It, it is uh, hidden. It, they're on the more on the run. They're trying to keep a low profile because everyone thinks that yes, Aang is at, dead. Yeah, because at the end of book two, at the end of season mm-hmm. two, um, Azula, you know, fatally wounds Aang, um, and he's brought back to life by some by some spirit water. That, that's how I think he's slow. <laughs> Pretty much. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyway, Plus, we finally see the the uh, allegiance of Zuko switch entirely. Yeah. As he decides to he follow his Zuko's heart city. and yeah. the teachings of Iroh, and he leaves is, to teach Aang firebending. Because remember, the whole thing. Is, hmm? Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I think the whole the whole switch of him from being you know with to, to the Avatar side is probably the best. I don't know. Ever. Uh, yeah. Best, yeah. Best, yeah. Best yeah. arc of a character. <laughs> switching from one side to another no, ever. No, it's, uh, scene where you can't do it more actually, perfectly than they did yeah. it. Yeah. That's actually, yeah, I, I take that back. He's, uh, where he's in the room with Ozai during the eclipse. No, no. Yes. Uh, the scene, oh, okay. I lo- That's my the scene where he's uh, like in the woods trying to say, like, hey, it's Mizuka. Oh, but Zuko you, here? You, you yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I so bad at me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, you guys, like, I had to pause. We had to pause the episode when he's, like, kneeling outside Iroh's tent. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, man, that was and good. And he can't go in. Like, he just can't. He can't. He's so ashamed. Like, oh, man, I'm getting shot. That hits me harder. Than so, uh, so, like, we're not, cool. if you're listening to this and you do not have okay. not watched the show. Watch the like, show. Like, we are not doing a good, um, <laughs> right. we're, we're doing a very bad job of telling you why it is that we like this show so much. But I also don't want to spoil anything because it really is best discovered by yourself. You don't sure, want a bunch of people to, to talk about it's it. On, we are Amazon, not doing it justice in the interest of time. Amazon Instant Prime, <laughs> yeah. you can get all three seasons of uh, Last Airbender and the first two seasons of uh, Legend of Korra. Yes. So, so I guess at the end of season, uh, Book Three Fire... The big fight is coming. Um, it has kind of built in a very traditional story fashion where it's pretty much the end of... It's going to be the end of everyone's freedom and the world as they know it. If the world Aang is literally going... does not stop Fire Lord Ozai. And, of course, as we talked about, he's a monk. So they have... They, you know, his entire approach is one of nonviolence. And he has become increasingly um, worried about how he's going to defeat Fire Lord Ozai. And, in fact... He did not get any help from his past incarnations as Avatar when he talked to them. Uh, he got both help, of them, not the help he was looking for. Yeah. Right, but he didn't get it from the corner that he thought it would come from, which would be his past lives, who were actually not helpful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. It, and how, how great was it that then you learned where they got their bending from, and it was from the lion turtle, and that was who gave him the advice. Oh, so good. Yeah. Now, okay, anyway. now this is a great bridge into the Legend of Korra, because we've gone through the first three Well, so basically he... he do we want to talk about what happens? Or do he we just want to say, Aang defeats he the world. He defeats Fire Lord Ozai. We will not spoil how that happens, but it is great, and you need to watch it. Yep. So the coolest okay. thing about the ending, well, not the coolest thing, but what uh, I remember when it first happened, it was really, really highly, like, it was a big point of conversation because the way yes. he ends up coming about defeating the Fire Lord just yes. kind of comes out of nowhere. It was it hinted much at before, 
it, I don't know. Just, if it was, just I go didn't, ahead and I didn't say catch it. it. Just go ahead and say it. He, okay. he takes so, away his bending. Yeah, so right, he discovers... We didn't know he could do that. We had no idea that that was a power yeah. the Avatar had. Yes. That's right. why it was so surprising. Agreed. And it was actually, when Ozai was fighting him, he I think he reconnected with the Avatar state, because he was having a hard time after his... Accessing it, yes. After his yeah. fatal incident, almost near fatal incident, accessing the Avatar state, and he knew that that's what he needed to do in order to defeat Ozai, whatever that looked like. And it's great, because it was a very much a way to... Defeat him without Ugh. killing him, so it was. Yeah, it was a non-violent answer to the problem. Yes, I think it just struck me so hard because I was expecting it that it was going to be Ang that would have to compromise his personal values that's for the for the for, for the better. Yeah, yeah, for everyone else, because that's usually how those sacrificial savior types go. And I was really impressed. I was stunned. I was speechless watching that for the first time. Mm-hmm. Man, I I got off my chair and cheered. It was so cool. Really powerful. Yeah such a great statement too I think that when the pressure is against you to do something that you don't feel is the right thing to do that you can still find a way you know to be true to yourself yep. and to not, not solve your problems with violence good stuff I didn't All find right. that now, now let's move on to Korra but okay. keep that in mind Okay. the, the finale of book 3 uh, okay. the last airbender keep that in mind because that comes back around in book 2 of the Legend of Korra alright so now that we're uh, so now that that's enough talk on uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. So now we have The Legend of Korra, which is uh, it's an extension of this universe. So now we are, what, 70 years into the future after the events of uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, um, and we get to really kind of see the impact that Aang made on the world, and now it's time for a new Avatar, and it's a waterbender named Korra. Mm-hmm. Korra she discovered she was the Avatar at a very, very young age. Yes. Traditionally, um, they don't tell the Avatar that they are the Avatar until, like, they're teenagers. But mm-hmm. Korra figured it out when she was teeny, like, three. It was, and she it was, was so a toddler, it yeah. was, She was adorable. She was so cute with her belly. I'm the Avatar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, God bless her parents, right? Mm-hmm. Indeed. But but that really plays into Korra's uh, personality, because she is all about being the Avatar, and she just wants to, you know, she's very physical, uh, she's uh, she's very tough, she's very headstrong, um, and, and also very, obviously very talented, but she's just all about being the Avatar, and I don't think she, at the beginning when we first meet her, she doesn't really know what it quite means to be the Avatar yet. Right. No. right. I mean, she, she was, knows, she's mastered right. water and earth and fire, and yeah. and... and she knows how to be powerful and do that, but she doesn't really understand any more than that. Yeah. And so that's basically uh, that's the, that is the journey for her for for throughout the show is how is she going to be a, uh, well especially through this first book what type of avatar is she going to be and then also coming to realize realize that she has more to learn uh, especially when she because uh, the first book uh, of Legend of Korra is called Air because she has to master airbending and her airbending teacher is Aang's son Ten. J.K. Is by J.K. my favorite character. Spider-Man! <laughs> oh, sorry. Or one of my favorite characters. <laughs> he is so good as Tenzin, though. I mean, mm-hmm. I know I know yeah. it for Portal, but... <laughs> really? Uh, That's where you go. Johnson. Not Ju- He's so good as hey, Tenzin. Hey, we're going like, to call I... him Juno Dad, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's what so, of course, you know, um, Korra has... Um, what would be the nice word for it? Some disagreements with Tenzin <laughs> on the best way to learn. Yes, <laughs> pretty much the opposite personality of Aang. Yeah, um, and of Air Aang, 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 true. Very in your face, you know, not spiritual in the least bit. No, the opposite. The opposite of what a monk is. That's, yes. that's what she is. <laughs> very confident, very outspoken, very mm-hmm. emotional. Yes. Yeah. So, so the first book of The Legend of Korra follows Korra in her journey to learn airbending. And, and along the way, she meets two uh, brothers from Republic City, where Tenzin is, uh, by the name of Mako and Bolin. And they are professional athletes. Pro-bending. Yes. Pro-bending. So now, because... You know, this is this uh, the show now is seventy years in the future. So now we're in about like the nineteen twenties or so. And one of the main things that people you know will go and go watch one of their main like you know like forms of entertainment is watching benders bend in an athletic sense. Which and so looks like, awesome. they bend for sport. Uh, so they have professional bending, and that's what these uh, these brothers are. It's very very cool. Uh, if if you've not watched the show and do not understand what we're talking about, watch the show and you'll understand. But it's very very cool. 
I think it's also worth noting that Republic City, where she has Cora has to go to find Tenzin to learn airbending, is kind of like a, a multicultural like state that emerged at the end of the last series from the Fire Nation colonies in the Earth Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like a multicultural like uh, it says melting pot. <laughs> Right, right. The series creators called it "If Manhattan Had Happened in Asia." There you uh, go. Cool, awesome. <laughs> so there, are, there are lots of um, everyone from all walk of life is here in this city. So while she's here in Republic City, she's met these two athletes, bending brothers Mako and Bolin, both a firebender and earthbender respectively. She stumbles upon a plot that is being hatched by this book's villain by the name of Aman. Aman is a leader of the Equalist yeah. Revolution, and his goal is to rid the world of benders, now, like peers. An interesting thing. Thereby making it equal. Uh, yes. That's right. Pretty much. Je yeah. uh, Nancy was talking er earlier about, you know, if, oh man, if I wasn't a bender, I'd be totally jealous of benders. And, and in this world, <laughs> uh, I don't know, they, I don't know if they ever mentioned what percentage of the people turn out to be benders, but obviously you're going to have more. Non benders, it's probably the minority, it's definitely the yeah. minority. Right. And so, but the vendors that are in charge of the government. Uh, they are leading the people in the different communities. Basically, they're leading the nations. I mean, they have most of the power, even though they are a minority. And so, mm -hmm. it, the interesting thing is, even though obviously he goes about it completely in the wrong way, obviously uh, he actually kind of has a point. The, yeah, what, what, he's not wrong at all. And I, my favorite, my absolute favorite moment from book one was there. You guys remember when uh, they imposed the curfew um, in Republic City? Mm -hmm. And there are all those people gathered around or gathered up. And um, Cora goes to investigate. And there is this lady in the crowd, a non-bender, that yells out to Cora, Please help us. She's a non-bender. She goes, help us, please. You're our avatar, too. And yep. that's so powerful. Mm. And I loved it. I loved it. I loved it so much. I can't I can't give that enough praise. It's so cool. I also think this was the first time that we got the signal in this series that it was going to be far more adult. Yes. And oh. by that, I mean it was a lot more complex. Especially the ending of like season the, one. Holy crap. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. the villains... The villains are good villains because they believe that they are doing the right thing. Yes, yes, all of which them do. you didn't really believe about Fire Lord Ozai. You just knew he was a tyrant. Yeah, <laughs> he's so just a bad person. And that was the theme of like just the Legend of Korra in general. Each right. each um each villain of each book had great ideas, just right. taken to extreme, as far extreme. Yes, I think far we should extreme. also remember to mention uh, Sami Sato. We haven't talked about her yet. Oh, oh yes. we can't forget about her. That's my girl. Love He's the head of Sister Industries. Uh, yes. A non-bender. Uh, yeah, because, uh, again, like, because she's, she's, you know, she's a non-bender. She's the, the daughter of Hiroshi Santo, uh, who is an inventor who makes, like, you know, the Santa Mobile. So the car is new in this timeline. Um, and so she's... Henry Ford. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah Henry Ford, yeah. The, the Ford Motor Company. And also, uh, don't so, worry about the radio, company, see? Also, Oh, that guy. <laughs> yeah, that guy. I love it yes, in, the, the in, in the very end, and this is jumping forward, where he's like, sure. I've been talking you through these last three books, and, and I've been glad to do it. This is funny. I'm like, sorry. Yeah. Side trope. Yeah, so Asami <laughs> rounds out. Um, she becomes friends you know, with Mako and Bolin and Korra. More than friends. Um, There's a whole love triangle. It's Asami all, is. And, and, yeah. and a true love triangle, we find out later. Yeah. Well, yeah, but we'll get to that, yeah. yes. kind of. So, so anyway, so Asami, is, Asami is definitely a a powerful woman, and she has never not been that. But she, she did a good job. Right out of the gate, you know, right out of the gate, she's like driving the cars fast yeah. when they're chasing after the villains. Like she can handle herself. Yeah. So the way they she looks and the way that you think they're gonna portray her as some kind of like Influence bitch character. Yeah, you know, definitely. But they yeah. only take a right turn and she's not that kind of character at all. Mm -hmm. She's very level headed, she's very nice, she's not trying to split the team up, you know. I agree with you, Travis. Like they really set up Asami from the way that her character looks. She traditionally looks like the vampy, bitchy, like yes. com competitive woman and then she is totally not that at all. Uh, yeah, and that's that's one of the things that this show does really well. They just kinda not throw the regular conventions to the wind. Yes. Um, and they keep you guessing. Uh, which is very, very, very 
uh, uh, well deserved at this point in time, you know, like because right. we're kind of t- you know because I think as viewers sometimes we we get tired of the same old types of tropes, and it's very nice to be kept on our edge and kept on our toes and get something new every now and again. And this and this is what the show did very well. Agreed. Oh, totally. Anyway, book one. Aman is the villain. It yep. turns out he has. It's revealed that he has the power to take people's bending away, which is a huge freaking deal. Because nobody should be able to do that except, except the, Avatar. the Avatar. But and it scares Korra beyond belief. It, She's terrified of this. But we find out that he could do that by bloodbending, right? Which is the freakiest Super thing spoilers. ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? Well, now we also meet Lin Bei Fong, who's the daughter Ooh. of Toph. Yep. Who is amazing. And she's a police chief, and she is carrying on the lineage and the legacy of Toph by by metal bending, something that Toph invented and figured out in book three of uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender. And now everyone yeah, awesome. metal bending. Like all the policemen in this in this Republic city, all have this metal bending. And they have these awesome way of moving around the city with their grappling hooks. It's just it's but amazing the, how they actually. Handle that. She figured out how to earth a metal bend in book two. Yeah, it was on her way back. One of those. Uh, and you know, that's, a, that's another thing I never really mentioned, talk about. But every single one of the police, uh, the policemen in this city is a not only a bender but specifically a metal bender. So I mean, well, that we've seen. You, we don't know. Like, well, the ones that, well, the ones that like that are with Lynn on certain patrols okay. were metal okay. benders well, because they had to have that skill. Because so right. remember. Because remember, Mako becomes, becomes uh, yeah. a police yeah. officer, and he's a fire. Yeah, but so okay, that, but that's after the the change in the at the end of the first season, where they they sort of they're sort of blending. And and the first season is just a matter of okay, maybe they have some non bender doing paperwork back at the office, but the Probably. people that are actually out there are the metal benders. So these people in the streets, you know, they're looking at the people protecting them, and it's like you're not like me, you're uh, you're mm. a metal bender. You're, it, it's it's a thing that we've seen in. in in our history, th- I mean, throughout history, where, you know, how am I supposed to feel safe if, I, I mean, I don't know if this metal bender is, uh, I don't know, anti-non-bender. Or well, yeah, well, it, it hits, the, that, that's a theme that hits home because everybody's looking for a face like theirs in some, in some exactly, respect. Exactly, exactly. Right. Okay. All right, okay. anyway, so Cora faces Armand the first time, doesn't go so hot, she faces him again, she wins, he's defeated, she learns how to airbend, everything's great. Book two. That's pretty much it. No, you uh, yeah. yeah. Although I, I think the most disappointed I kind of was in the whole core series was at the end of book one, because I really thought they gave Core's powers back way too quickly. I, I did thought too. They, I, I thought they would stretch that out for maybe the whole second season, or maybe just a little bit in the second season that she'd have to relearn and regain all her powers. I, I thought, thought they were going like to do like that. Kind of like a cop out, like oh, you know. Exactly. Well, remember, they also didn't know that that show was going to come back. though. Exactly. That's it was true. supposed to be a mini series. It was yeah. Just that's true. one book, okay. twelve episodes, and then it was done. But then everybody was like, they, "Holy crap, this is amazing! Give us more!" I mean, I thought that it, it would make so much sense for them to do like a Metroidvania type of thing, where you see how powerful she is, but then yeah. she goes back to just being a waterbender, and then and then the, yeah. and then the next thing, the next three seasons of her learning. I mean, I'll. I don't know why they didn't do that, but I actually like about well, well, I don't think they wanted to do what they yeah. 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 like the creator it. said they didn't want to tell the hero's journey all over again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God. This is kind of like uh, it, bringing it to another thing, like Daenerys and uh, and uh, Game of uh, Thrones. How she's now yeah. she's sort of at the end of the book. She's sort of learning how to rule, and that's kind of a spoiler. But it, it, it's, her, it's not know. her becoming the Avatar; it's her being the Avatar. And one thing right. that I like about this is how she can easily switch on and off for the most part the Avatar state because that's just something you really saw being used, um, like except for very I don't know, special occasions well, in the first for series. Her to it's easy for her, and it's also her emotions. Yeah, and also it scared Aang to use it. Remember, because yeah. he was it, he was scared of that power. I know, yeah, I, I know, I know why. I'm power. saying it's nice to see that because she's like, oh, I sure. need an extra boost. Let's go super say. I mean, uh, Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so the okay. second season right. we start Book off two, in the, uh, the I, uh, water tribe. Yep. Six months later. <laughs> yes, and we meet Unalak. Who's Korra's uncle? Of the Northern Water Tribe. Yeah, who is Korra's uncle? And he is the main villain of book two. Douchebag. Well, he's one such of the main a bag. Yes. Well, he starts out they pretty okay. Had that creepy no, uncle. he doesn't. He was creepy from the beginning. Well, but I mean, at the beginning, see, at the very beginning, he was like, well, he seems to have Korra's best interest at heart. Clearly, there's something off about him, but you know, he seems. He's got his ideals. He's he's you know he's trying to. It seems like he's trying yeah, to do they, the right they thing. Yeah, they have their ideals. 
And then eventually it was like, oh man, this, this guy's no. Yeah, because also because you know that. Unalak is he was because book two is about spirits and the spiritual world and the Avatar spiritual connection and Unalak was trying to get Korra to to, to see that and, and to, to train with him initially because uh, he just yeah. he was just using her. Uh, right. the whole time but that is the whole crux of of the second season it's all about spirits and uh it's worth mentioning that in this in this uh in season two we get beginning this two-part episode which basically goes all the way back to the to, to the it's, very, it's avatar history first. and it goes back to the very first avatar and it was the oh, two yeah. best episodes of of, of mm-hmm. the entire show absolutely absolutely what well, I, I mean if i, if I haven't if it wasn't, if I didn't already love it, those two episodes. I, I love origin stories, so seeing mm-hmm. that. And you knew they were going to give it to us in this season. And I didn't. Yes. I didn't know yeah. that. I, I mean, no, okay. I, I expected I, it. I, it. We had I, go, we had been in this universe for far too long for any good writer to not give us that. Well, I, I didn't really even think about ever getting that thing. So, Me either. So when I saw it, I was like, Really? Nice. No, I never no. thought we'd go any further okay. back than um, Yang Chen. Really? Wow. Oh, no, I kind of expected them to do Maybe it. Maybe that's just the writer in me. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, that's I, probably I, just the writer in you. I, I, yeah, I, that's I, that's I, the common folks weren't expecting Yeah, Lance, remember, that's we used to talk numbers. about, we're like, they've got to show the beginning. Yeah. They've got to show something from that. I didn't think we would get to see the first Avatar, I didn't and I didn't think that the story would be that good, because, whoa. Yeah, because, <laughs> cause, and honestly, kind of yeah. like how, like, Ace, you were talking about, like, you know, that, that scene with, uh, with, with uh, Korra and those people that, uh, it's the curfew thing, um, that, now that's your favorite scene. My favorite scene is at the very end of Beginnings, and, and Juan is dying, and with his last breath, like, you know, uh, Rava tells him that it's going to be all okay, and that they'll be together for their entire lifetimes, and then you hear a baby being born. That's like, totally that is like, yeah. some epic big stuff. I don't know. Yeah. When, uh, I'm, I'm going a, a little earlier back further than when he touches the um, the portal when he's fused with Robin and he touches the portal during a harmonic convergence mm-hmm. and he stands up and his eyes are glowing and he's in the Avatar state and then he cool says too. we are bonded forever. I get chills every time I watch that. Yeah, that and then he just cool. goes ham. Oh god that was so cool. <laughs> yeah. He does. Yeah. Ham. <laughs> he does go ham. He do. <laughs> Just yeah, so, so Unalak, so Unalak the villain, right, really wants to open the polar portals to the spirit world, and he wants to do this during harmonic convergence, which is like a like I don't remember how long how far apart it is, but it rarely ever happens. 10, 000, if someone's probably ten thousand years. That's, that's the common. Ten thousand, yeah. okay, and it's an alignment of planets, you know, that I think allows him to free the, the evil spirit. So Vatu, which is sort of the embodiment of evil, evil. And who is the counterpart to Rava, who is the Avatar spirit, the embodiment sort of, of life. Type right. of thing. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, exactly. that's what they look like visually. Yes. Yeah, they do. Oh, that was so cool when they were fighting. Uh, yeah. It looked like yeah, yeah. It's really cool. So Unalak gets his gets his way pretty much. He kind of tricks Korra into doing Holding what he needs Korra. her to do. Yeah. So he goes there with the express purpose of freeing Vatu and fusing with him to sort of become like a, a Nega Korra. Yeah. I was so hoping that they weren't going to do that, a dark avatar. I thought that was so cheesy. Really? Uh, I thought you know, it was cheesy. I, it kind of, it, in a classic <laughs> like Shakespearean sense, it, it, made, it made sense. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it kind of makes sense, too, because Korra had not really been tested spiritually. She'd only been tested... I guess physically. mentally and physically by Amon, so it sort yeah. of makes sense that then her next test would be a spiritual one. Yeah. And of course, they, and I, y'all, I was surprised at the consequences that came from that fight. I yes. wasn't expecting there. It, I was expecting we, like we it to wrap it. up. We can, we can, oh no, I'll, I will. But it's like as she's fighting it, she inadvertently like the link to all the previous her previous past lives is broken, which is again not something that we thought could happen. And then, mm-hmm. then yeah. and <laughs> so when they're fighting. Unalak, who is fused with Vatu, become became a dark avatar. Literally rips the avatar spirit out of Korra's body. Yeah, yeah. just lays it on a it rock and wipes it out. Yeah, I mean stuff. it was pretty. Yeah. And what well, you you mentioned how she loses her connection to her past avatar lives, mm-hmm. and I kept expecting it to be like, oh, well, we fixed it, everything's okay, but it never is. She it's yeah. just cut off, and so the people in the in the avatars in the future, they're not going to be able to connect. It's just like holy crap! Well, no, they're only going to be probably only going to be able to connect to Korra. That's kind of what I. Yeah, she's the new one. They're just hanging yeah, out, right. uh, yeah. which I thought was 
really, I mean, I think that that had a lot to say about the, you know, like change from like traditional to like progressive kind of, I thought that was really interesting. Plus, kudos for having consequences and sticking with them and letting it affect the rest of the story. Absolutely. Because that's always a problem, even with adult fare. Yeah. It's never the concept. I mean, it makes everything not matter that mm-hmm. happened in the story because the consequences don't matter or can be reversed. Or you know, some godly alien comes out and waves his magic wand and fixes everything. Agreed. Fix Janora. Yeah. And so. Oh, did I well, say that out loud? You did. But now, now along that uh, that train of thought, let's keep this moving. So basically, Cora saves the world again, but right. as Nancy mentioned, at great cost. And there's lots of consequences to this, and we see that in book three, which is called Change. Some of the consequences that we see is that. Um, obviously, there are spirits now in the um, moral in the realm, world. the physical world. Um, mm-hmm. Plus, we've got uh, uh, the Republic City has these spirit wilds growing all through it. That uh, as a result, as a fight. result of the fight. Uh, but one interesting change is that they're now all of a sudden popping up, as you see in like the first scene, new Airbenders. As a result of the Hermione. Yes. 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 So people that didn't have powers before now have gained powers all across the world. Which is so awesome. Here, I want to talk awesome. about Boomy for a second. So yeah, okay. Let's go back. So Katara and Aang, obviously, they got together at the end of The Last Airbender, and they had three children. Their first child was named Boomy. Their second child, and Boomy was a not was a not a bender at all, but he went on to join the the army, the United Republic forces, and became a general there. Um, they had a second child by the name of Kaya, who was a waterbender, and then their third child by the name of Tenzin, who was, you know, an airbender and now the only airbending master that was Korra's teacher. And so um, when harmonic convergence came, now we've got all these new airbenders, and now Boomy, the first child, has been granted airbending powers. Hooray! Now, I'm going to tell y'all, everybody, to go watch the show because it's so good. Because that has, you know, like some real heartfelt um, moments in there. Moments to it. Because, you know, he was their first child. He wasn't an airbender and he kind of felt like he was a disappointment because he knew how big of a deal that was because his father was the last airbender and it's a whole thing. But it's very heartfelt. Please, please go watch the show. My God. So good. <laughs> right. Anyway, let's move on. So okay, what so Boomy gets... Boomy becomes an Airbender. Yes, mm-hmm. <laughs> much to Tenzin's chagrin, probably. Yeah. I would say Initially, most of the yeah. time. Initially. <laughs> Initially, especially because Boomy and Tenzin have opposite personalities, and he just wants to fool around, kind of like Milo, and not actually learn anything. Woo, Milo! <laughs> I was on my I was on Milo train since day one. Me too. Character Here, of mine. I, I, I think they put him in there really just to remind everyone of the original Aang, like how he was when they first started. Mm-hmm. The little bald headed kid. Oh, Milo. So, Milo is the youngest of Tenzin's children. Well, at, when we first meet him, the youngest of Tenzin's children. Tenzin yeah. now has four kids. The oldest, Janora. They're all airbender. Well, we don't know about Rohan yet. The youngest. He probably is. Probably is. Wait, his name is Rohan? Is. Uh-huh. Rohan. Mm-hmm. So their oldest is Janora, <laughs> who at this point... No, she's not. Not yet. Never mind. Yet. So um, there's Janora, who's the oldest, very studious, very serious, very knowledgeable. Then there's Iki, the second oldest... Who is hyper very inter- the middle child? Inter- very, yeah, yeah, very energetic the hyper middle child. <laughs> very middle child. And then there's uh, Milo, who's the youngest. He was a boy and just you know off the wall, crazy, goofy as all get out. Basically, a typical uh, little boy. Yes, exactly. Okay, so like we were talking about, a lot of people all across the different nations have discovered that they have airbending powers as a result of the harmonic convergence. So Tenzin and Team Avatar sort of move out to find these people, gather them up, Tenzin wants to train them, and finally have, like, reestablish the the air air nomads. Yes. Right. Then we are introduced to our villain for this season, who is Zaheer, who receives airbending. And which is which is interesting to find out about Zaheer. He was already a, a follower of air nomad philosophy and traditions. He was kind of like an air acolyte. Right. Um, and so... You know, when we first meet him, like he, when he gets his powers, when, like he is automatically just like a master, uh, because of his, because of his past and how he, in, in, like, ingratiated himself. Well, he knows how to use his airbending. He's, he uses it to augment his already very, very capable fighting skill. Yeah. No, I want to bring that up. So, 
um, the first thing that he does when Sierra gets out is he goes and gets out and breaks his buddy out of jail. And they're all uh, super. They're, we got a lava bender, we got a super awesome water bender, and we have a combustion lady. And, mm-hmm. and so uh, and they're all in these really cool jails that are made specifically for them, which I love. Now, yeah, because they were all very dangerous uh, criminals. Yeah, I, I'm, and so like uh, many many years ago, I guess 15 years ago, 13 it was. They um, they tried to kill Cora. Now. No, 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 no. Is that right? No, no, no. They tried to kidnap Cora. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yes. Kid, I'm sorry. Because kidnap their, Cora. And, and, their goal was to take the Avatar and, like, train them under their... Their tutors, tra- their guides. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The way they think the world should have been. And, and, um... But the thing because is, as we find, they are all part of the opposite of the White Lotus. The Black Lotus. The Red Lotus. I know, I know, I know. I just white black. <laughs> the Black Lotus, yeah. That's, red that's, Lotus, that's, which is sort of like, like a an green lantern anarchy. core. Oh, there's a yellow Sorry. lotus now. Oh crap! Star Sapphire right. Lotus. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, but the point is, right. is that you have these four people, and like three of them are super powerful. And then you have this guy who can't even binge. He's like, I know karate, and it's like, w- w- who are you? What dude? <laughs> Ball head a little bit. And came to find out that he was the leader. Mm-hmm. Like, how dangerous was this guy to where these re- ultra powerful benders? You know, right. he was their leader. That's that's that speaks volumes. It is true. And so they 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 go out and they're they're all escaped now. And they're starting over their plan, which is to capture the Avatar and more important, importantly, to uh, get rid of all the world leaders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Shut them down. So so much like Unalak's ultimate goal was like. You know, complete spiritual, like you know, real realignment. I guess mm-hmm. um, he was going for complete spirituality. And Amon, his ultimate goal was equality. The Red Lotus's goal was um, like order through chaos. Yes, yeah, pure anarchy. Basically. Yeah. So right. by just getting rid of all the world leaders, everything will fall into its natural state, and the people will be free to do their own thing. Of course, you know, just in extreme, and that it, you know, didn't work out so well. <laughs> it never does. Right. They never. They do kill the Earth Queen, though. They yeah, do. and that was another big like, whoa, the this is thing. happening! Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> so, so all the for everybody that's always, you know, if, you know, if you're online, if you're, you know, reading the various threads online, and everybody's like, oh, you know. Firebenders have lightning and earthbenders have metal bending, blah, blah, blah. What an air nomads do? It's like, well, I oh. suppose. And if people would always like theorize. It's like, well, yeah, I guess they could kind of create a vacuum and suck all the air out of a person's body, and yeah. then they actually and did then it, it on happened. the show. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. Anyway. It was insane. So come to find out, the Red Lotus's plan has shifted a little bit since they aren't able to capture the Avatar and, you know, um, train the Avatar into their way of thinking, they're just going to get rid of the Avatar line, oh, period. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and this might be a good time to mention, since this is where they sort of attack, is we um, sort of, we are introduced to an all-metal-bending community, a city, Zalfu, which is led yeah, by um, Chief Beifong's sister, Su Beifong, who is also, obviously, Toph's daughter. And uh, it's, it's just an interesting sort of community, because they have, like, these weird, like, Lotus flower uh, cities that can close up at night through the power of metal bending, uh, and, and this city kind of becomes important in season four. It's a right. pretty, it's a strategic, you know, sp- space in the Earth Kingdom. And, yes, and uh, she. Uh, one thing that's important to, and I don't know. Uh, basically, what happens season three? She fights here, she loses, and she gets more powerful, and she. Fights him again, beats him. That happens in all all the seasons. It's the same storyline <laughs> where she fights him twice and loses the first time, and wins the second time. But right. an interesting thing about this, and I, I think I mentioned before, I don't know if it was before we started recording, but in each of the seasons, she learned something from her the villains. Her villains, yes. The, the, mm-hmm. the first season, uh, right. uh, she learns that hey, benders and pro benders, they should be equal. Let's set up a an actual non bending. Uh, president that can actually lead the people, and it, it sounds like they're, I guess, prevent, you know, for integrating the police force and all types of lot, walk. From the second season, um, she does become more connected with the spirits, 
and she uh, and, and the spirit world and the physical world are now sort of combined. And the third season, um, I mean, she really does I don't, I learn from so here in terms of I don't know. Uh, I think she starts seeing the the faults of like the Earth Kingdom and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think she sees the way that everything's set up now isn't, like, super ideal. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. um, you can have people... Yeah, because earlier in the season, we see, like, she goes and does some things for the Earth Queen when the Earth Queen was, you know, still in power. Yeah. And she realized, hey, this this isn't right, the way she's treating these people. Also came to find out that the Earth Queen, because, she, you know, she's the queen, she has kind of... Um, ultimate power in the within the earth uh, earth nation that she was finding all the airbenders that had been granted these powers during harmonic conversion convergence convergence thank you <laughs> conversion during harmonic <laughs> convergence and was bringing them forcibly into her army and was going to use them as soldiers whether they liked it or not mm-hmm. correct and so uh, that's what she learns from you know book 3 and Zaheer is like, hey, you know, people in power more like uh, have the, you know, they're going, they're more likely, they're more likely than not are going to abuse it. Yeah. Absolute power. Not corrupts, everybody. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not everybody who's in power deserves to be in power absolutely. and isn't absolutely. the best. Right. For, or best for the people. And um, I guess sort of how the how the whole season ends is she has this climactic battle. With Zaheer mm-hmm. and she's At been, great cost she's, once again. She's been poisoned. Uh-huh. Um, it was very traumatic for her. Um, uh-huh. She finally gets the poison out, but it, it, it's, it affects her so much she basically loses the ability to walk, bend anything. And, and, yeah. and so that was probably like a near death experience for her because he removed the air from her lungs, so he's choking her. Mm-hmm. He's suffocating her to death, yeah. and then he poisoned her with. Uh, I assume it's mercury, mercury. but yeah. Yeah. it was okay. mercury. Right. Well, she didn't know about that, I guess. Well, right. well, it, they thought that Janora had gotten, or no, who, who was it? Sue. That's right. Um, they thought that Sue had gotten all of the poison, but clearly it had not, which we learn later on in book four, which is why it took her part of the reason why it took her so long to recover yeah. from that yeah. Yeah. from that fight. Basically, in, in season four. Um, it's been three years since the end of season three. Uh, no one really knows where Cora is. Um, She's, she was recovering at the, the well, I guess... Yeah, the, I think she's recovering at the Water, the water Tribe, tribe. Right? Uh, But then they find out that she's been gone for six months. And what has she been doing? She's sort of been, you know... Starting her own fight club. Pretty yep. much. She's mm-hmm. sort of been fighting herself, you know, independently, living on her own. She cut her hair, which looks great. You know, whenever mm-hmm. I cut my hair with a dull knife, it kind of just messes it up. But she did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's she's, just she's trying, yeah, she's, she's trying she's to find herself. behind who she was before because um, she can't get past. She always has nightmares about Zaheer's attack. Mm-hmm. And it's t- she can't recover. And for someone like Cora, you know, who is often extremely frustrated with not being able to do what she wants when she wants to do it. Plus, I thought it was interesting that they really, again, stuck with their guns with there are consequences when something like that happens to you, yes, especially if you're the Avatar. Yes, yeah, so she, she basically spends the first half of book four going through what is it, post-traumatic stress disorder? PTSD, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. depression, definitely. And depression. That's exactly what she's mm-hmm. going through at the beginning of book four. And it was, it's, it was, it's really, really, um, yeah, that, that's a great, right, yeah, vocabulary. That's right. Really. <laughs> she also sees, like, a dark version of herself haunting her steps, which, of course, is just her, you know, psyche in some yeah. ways. And but right, so she's traveling to discover herself to try to get back her strength. She meets, t- she, she meets Toph and... Toph kind of helps her work through some stuff. Who's old lady living mm-hmm. in a and, swamp? When she meets Toph, you know, she meets <laughs> Toph, and Toph tells her, hey, you've still got poison in you. And so at what? first it was like, oh, that's the only trouble. And so oh, well. Toph tries to help her get it out, but she's not right mentally to get the poison out of her. But she works through that, and that's all fine and dandy, and everything's great. Um, what else? Do we get out of well, then, well, she, she, she realizes that, 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 you know, getting that poison out is, 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 like, she's still held back from something. She can't figure it out. So she goes to meet Zaheer, uh, who's in prison. 
Um, yeah, sorry, yeah he's the villain from from the previous season, and it's only after that when she finally faces her fear that he instilled in her by you know nearly killing her, um, you know that she finally is able to finally get over that hump. Yep, yeah. and right. so which is good because oh, Kuvira is yeah. our villain for this season. Tum, tum, tum. I love Kuvira so great. Well, I love is that you see her at the end of season three. Yes, you do. Yeah, apparently. But she saves well, her no, no, no. You actually see her all throughout season three. Like, every time... She's we just go not anybody. Talk, yeah, yeah, she's just in the background. Yeah, she's all... Like, physically, she's... Every time we see Su Yin, lit, or Kuvira's there, just, you know, kind of hanging out. She was, you know, like right. Kuvira's adopted daughter. So she right. was always that's there. True, that's true, just that's finally, true. at the end of book three, she's finally something. like, hi, I'm Kuvira. And at first, when we... Because she was tending the Tonrock, Korra's father, at the end of book three, and at first, everybody's like, hold up, who... Where, who is she? Where did yeah. she come from? Uh-huh. Why is she trying to give Tom Rock those kind of that kind of look? Tom yeah. Rock's married. Exactly. Drop that. For, for, yeah. for, 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 that's funny because the first time that when I saw that, I forgot. I forgot he was married. I'm like, is this gonna be like a thing? And she's gonna have like a little brother. <laughs> uh-huh. <Sheesh. laughs> and remember that in third season, um, Zahir and the other is his friends killed the Earth Queen. So the Earth King, the Earth Empire is in disarray. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, so Kavira is trying to. Well, Kavira takes over basically. She steps in. Well, they had asked Su Yin to do it, but then and the, yeah, you well, find she that said out. no, and so Kavira stepped in, and it's kind of a good thing. She's uniting the Earth, tr- uh, all the Earth uh, communities. And, right, you but then you find out that she's uh, kind there of there are a lot of shades of Hitler in this season. Yes, there are. <laughs> and and uh, she's got to go about it poorly, and um, mm-hmm. uh, and when the when the season starts, she's just about finished, and they're supposed to be giving their power to Prince Wu, and then she says, you know what? I'm just gonna stay in power, and also, attack! Well, and Prince Wu is unpopular, because he has... Well, he's, he's just a doofus. Well, he, he's a typical... Yeah, he is, but he's he's typical royalty. You know, he, yeah. has, he has no sense of his... He just uses his position to order people around and do whatever he pleases. He has no real understanding of what the people, people are going through. Right, and Kuvira has a legitimate, although her methods are pretty draconian, she, you know, is intent upon making it safe in the way that she thinks is the right way to do it. Yeah. To reunite everybody. Of course, we come to find out through Bolin, who, you know, unwittingly, as is his way, sweet boy, <laughs> <laughs> who Not goes that. along with Kuvira until he realizes what she's doing is wrong. <laughs> And then yeah. he and Varric. We haven't talked about Varric, yeah, but Ace, would you like to talk about him? Talk about I love Varric. Go ahead, Lance. Varric is we met we meet Varric in season two, um, and he is uh, he's very abstract, <laughs> um, but he's a brilliant scientist. He has a brilliant mind. He's very and, much like Howard Hughes. Yes, yeah, that's a very good way to, yeah. to describe that's, Varric. That's okay. a like, yeah, and, so, uh, except instead of being that kind of crazy, he's like literally like yeah, do the thing. Yes, yeah. that's his signature catchphrase. Do the do thing. thing. With his long suffering assistant, assistant Julie. Uh huh. Which Julie do the thing. Julie we'll get to that. That's part of the finale. We'll do it. Right, right. But we just need to bring him up. He, he is usually um, somewhere in the season. Not in the seasons after that. He's inventing something. He well, actually, he was he was gone for a little while. He <laughs> was. He had been a while later. He turned on. He said he was like all over the yeah, place. Yeah, he's always he has. he's a mover and shaker. He's a true neutral personality, yeah. I think. Although he's got, he, he would like Initially. to pretend. Well, he's he's sort of Tony Starkish. They really made him that way in the last season, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. He tries, yeah, I and mean, he tries really hard. Like he, he tries literally to pretend made an Iron Man suit in book three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, but he's yeah. he's one of those like bombastic, loud, selfish. Bombastic. But you can't help liking him uh-huh. sort of characters because really he's can't. funny oh god That's everything funny. he says is hilarious but yeah. anyway so we're in season yeah, so. we're in season 3 Kuvira is at the height of her power she's still she's four, she, four. She, oh, she, I'm sorry season 4 she's trying to take over the last two sort of strongholds which is Zhao Fu which sort of happens in the first confrontation between her and Korra Right. And, uh, and it's sort of at this point that Bo Lin and uh, Varric realize this woman's freaking crazy and they get out of Dodge and uh, before they do Varric actually stumbles upon a incredible uh, weapon which uses the um, uh, spirit vines oh I, I, I thought it was the um, uh, gosh the Final Fantasy 7 <laughs> 
Is it, oh. No, it's spirit vines. I know what you're saying. Three, three, whatever. No, the, yeah. Life force. Life force. No, yeah. I it's, it's exactly that. They're basically Shinra, but the, so <laughs> yeah. he, he, you know, create this giant weapon, which is sort of the second half of the season with uh, Kavira sort of creating this giant weapon. It's a weapon of mass destruction. Yeah, yes. and um, and so they finally all come together, the team Avatar. Um, because Mako has been guarding the the prince, prince. and Asami has been, um, I guess, just doing her thing and minting shit. <laughs> yeah, she's running her father's company, yeah. company. now that she's yeah, gotten she's it the back. C- yeah, she's the like chief inventor and CEO person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Asami's been doing her thing. She's still brilliant. She's still got you know the mind of a businesswoman doing her thing. But you know she's just been waiting on her friends. Not waiting on her friends, but she still will jump at the opportunity right. to yeah. help her friends. Yeah. Well, it's important to note that uh, over those three years when Korra was recovering in the Water King, uh, Water Tribe, she, uh, y- you see through some flashbacks that she tried writing notes to Mako and Bolin, but the only person she could really like keep in contact with was Asami. Yeah, and truly open and, up to and, But I'm right. <laughs> great. Yeah, this all is y'all relevant. people, all y'all people that didn't see that coming, you're just you were too you were too. I saw it. We saw it coming. I, yeah, we did. Mm. Anyway, anyway, like, I didn't know they were going to do it. <laughs> anyway, I, well, Kuvira we'll, has we'll a get to that at the end. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so Kuvira is coming to reclaim Republic City, claiming and rightfully so, I guess, in the, in some sense, that it's on Earth Kingdom territory, so it's in Earth Kingdom City, yeah. and it's hers to take. Yeah. And that kind of brings us to the last showdown. Mm-hmm. It does. And what he brings to Republic City yeah, is a bad guy style mech. Yeah, we'll call yeah, it yeah, yeah. straight Pacific Ridge. Yeah, that's what I say. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's Van Gallienish too. Yeah, I think it's more even Gallienish. The, the way it looks to me. I agree. I don't know. And so, uh, I mean, it, and it's carrying a spirit cannon. Yeah, arm. which is just really ridiculous and really awesome at the same time. Absolutely. But, it can, but, but it's a very high st- it's It presents very high stakes. And it's just like, how are they going to defeat this thing? Like, you know, this is a, this is the, you know, this is the finale, the series finale. This is like the grandest stakes that the, that the show's ever seen. Like, we'd have right. no idea how they're going to pull this off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there was not a lot of time. I mean, that was the last episode <laughs> yeah there was just not a lot of time left we kept pausing to check like wow what is going to happen how is this going to wrap up <laughs> yeah so yeah so Kavira marches into uh, Republic City she's controlling this massive massive robot that's got a massive massive uh, can't spirit cannon on its arm um, and the outside of it is covered in platinum and Traditionally, well, not even traditionally, just period. You can't like metal benders can't bend platinum because it's too pure of a metal. And so everybody's combined powers. They don't know how they're going to stop this this uh, massive, massive robot. And so they try a couple things to try and stop it, and those don't work. But finally, um, Asami's father, who was, had been imprisoned comes up with the idea of how they can get inside of the robot and do some damage there. And so everybody, they do that thing. He heroically sacrifices himself to make the cut. Poor Asami. Poor Asami. I feel, I'm so, anyway, no, 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 let me, okay. So she, he sacrifices himself. They make their way in. They break the robot from the inside out. Mm-hmm. And Cora and, yeah, Cora and Kuvira have an epic fight. Um, in the cockpit in of this thing. Plate, in a tiny plate. Yes, that, was, yeah. uh, that was so good. Like, the, the action sequences on the show, I mean, are, are pretty incredible. I love the watching Metal Benders. Yeah, the choreography is so very good, always. I love yeah. watching Metal Benders fight, man. It's just like they're whipping shit over there, tying up their hands, oh, making a fly that. that Su Yin mm-hmm. fight Kavira, it was so cool when she bent the metal around oh her body. Oh, my God, yes. Oh, yeah, that, that was, was bad. Oh, it was good stuff. Ripped that pole off and was swinging it around like oh, yeah. Freaking Nightwing! It was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> anyway, so they defeat this giant kit. They defeat this giant robot. Bolin learned how to uh, lava bend, which is cool. That's worth mentioning because yeah. lava bending is awesome. And so um, they defeat this giant metal mechanical hulking monster. Um, but during the process, the spirit cannon ends up being flung in the middle of Republic City, where there's all these spirit and vines. The spirit wilds. Right, into the spirit wilds, and um, Kuvira 
ends up escaping into the spirit wilds with Korra in hot pursuit. Yeah. And Vera stumbles onto the cannon, oh, which man. is wrapped around in spirit vines. She turns it on. And has the nerve to fire it and actually has fires the, it. Yeah. Right. And has the nerve to fire it. And so she's so wrapped up in her vision as she's trying to destroy everything. But Korra and, but, and ends up losing control of the cannon. And yes. Korra and, you know, at, has grown so much over the series jumps in front of the cannon in front of this massive spirit beam goes into the avatar state to try to save Kuvira and in doing so ends up creating a new spirit portal in the middle of Republic City that first of all that was an absolutely beautiful scene yes. and yes. when they showed that, that scene that, that shot of Kuvira like just staring in awe at the raw power of the avatar that's oh my god! I love that shot. Mm-hmm. That so so. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, right. Uh, everything so, saved. Republic City saved. Everything's all fine and dandy. Kavir has been taken off to jail. Korra's safe. Everybody's no, you know, everybody's alive except for you know Hiroshi Sato. Anyway. Well, I think it's <laughs> important to note that in this her here. I mean, she's Korra has really. I would not say well, she has grown up, but. More she has, she's like fully come into her own, I think, as to what being the Avatar means. I think she channels, she channels Aang a lot more yeah. in this finale yeah. than the other ones because when she talks to Kuvira, it's, I mean, it's really touching because it's obvious. Kuvira, didn't she all get shades of like Azula when she was broken? Yes, like, yeah, oh, I mean. And yeah. her look also, like, let's oh, how yeah. they preserve her visually. The, the, like, the hair on her face. Yeah. She now, just I'm glad they didn't yeah. go full breakdown on it, but yeah. No, well, yeah. she wouldn't have because Kuvira is not mentally and emotionally unstable like Azula. Yeah. Right. She, she's just, well, she, I mean, you could also argue how bad of a person is she really, but anyway, it's just, I loved that she was just like, oh, we're the, we're the same. And Kuvira, of course, is the one who can't understand because she's blind. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so good. Very good. So she manages to resolve that. She brings her out of the spirit portal. She doesn't have to kill her or anything like that. That, that wasn't even really on the table. Right. She was just going to do something to take care of her. She right. needs to the justice. She, right, yeah. exactly. Right. So and then brings us to the end. Very good. And Julie got married. That was very, very beautiful. Bolin. Which I think we all saw coming, too, as yes. fans. Yeah. Very good, Julie. Well, you, yeah. <laughs> You do the thing for the rest of our lives. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was I a great cried. <laughs> Teared up I, so much. I geeked out. And then uh-huh. Bolin at the wedding. You may now do, do the, the thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, mentioned, I mentioned to Nancy that, like, that because, you know, me and Ace watched it together along with our other friend Bradley and Scotty. And, like, we all, like, when he proposed, got up from the couch and, like, we're acting like an NBA bench when somebody does a dunk or something because we were giving each other a dap. We were going nuts. And this is a for, like, this animated show. It's really ridiculous. But, oh, like, but it was so, it was so well good. good. Yeah, I know. But that, oh. that's, the, that's the reaction that it, that it, uh, it, it, it you know, got from us. So good job, Brack. Oh, yeah. so good. So we get to the end and the the real reason we're having this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. It's all boiled down to this. She gets the other Mako. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, did they bait you into thinking that was going to happen. Oh, that was, that was, uh, that was a quick bait. I felt pretty quickly he was said, you know, I always stand behind you. Oh, like, of course. But it was uh, just funny nope. how they were like, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so at the wedding, she walks away from kind of the festivities. She runs into Mako. They have, like, a nice a platonic friendship, like, oh, you know, we both care for each other. I'm always going to be there for you. I love you in a platonic way. Oh, that's nice. And, and she then, has a Tenzin, which I was, I was, I really enjoyed that. Hilarious. I love Tenzin yeah. so much. And then I love how, like, Asami comes over and, like, totally twists Tenzin up into a pretzel. Uh-huh. And has him run off like, that doesn't sound like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tenzin, such a rule follower. God bless him. Oh, man. And then we get to the real meat of the situation. Right. So, so going into this, um, I know most of us talking right now, especially, well, I know Lance and I guess Ace, um, we had been rooting for Asami and Korra to be a couple since like Korra season Asami. two. Yeah. Probably. I hadn't even thought about but, it. So, I mean, I think, I think that the, the signs were there and especially after she was like, 
I, it was at the end of season three that I really thought there was oh, yeah, like a glimmer that they yeah. might do that they might do it. I thought they were just going to hint at it, but they weren't going to actually like make it a thing because who's helping her get ready and like trying to get her to be cheer up after she's wheelchair ridden after Zahir almost killed her? It's Asami. Mm-hmm. Who yeah. did she write to all the time? Asami. I mean, at some point, it's not friendship. It's not now, just friendship. I knew I knew it was sealed in yeah. book four. <laughs> Episode seven reunion when they yes. finally all meet to meet back up and yes. she meets, she sees us on me for the first time. It's been like three years. She finally yep. sees her and she blushes. I was like, she yep, blushes. Yep. It's, yep. it's done. It's that done. was it. So oh man, I knew what was happening yeah, after that? Knew they were actually see, do it. They were actually going to be like, see, this is right. it. This is the thing. Right. See, yeah. I thought they were just going to hit that in, but not actually do anything with it. So I was kind of watching that scene where Asami and Cora have a, a talk, you know. They have their how, heart to heart. Right. And which totally didn't feel, oh, it was just everything about the, the last, like, five minutes was exquisite because it was so well done. I personally, I know some people do not agree, but I don't care about those people. Yeah, they're, they're it wrong. Was, it was, they are wrong. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you're wrong. It, it was just was so well done. It didn't feel forced. It felt like the culmination of something that they both kind of realized a long time ago. But now after all this shit has happened, like, why don't we just yeah. see where this goes? Exactly. Like, right. So in the ending scene, which is fabulous, is them deciding they're going to go on vacation, you know, oh, kind sure. of like, well, I've always wanted to see the spirit world. And it's like, well, let's just go do that, the two of us. Mm-hmm. So then the next scene, let's the last scene is them. Yes. You know, standing in front of the new spirit portal that that crazy weapon created in the middle of Republic, or the ruins, I should say, of Republic City. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, they're facing each other. They're holding hands. Like, I don't really know what else could really signify that to people, but whatever. And then they, you know, turn, still holding hands, and walk into the portal, and that's the end. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so, so I was going insane. So they're faced in the glow of the spirit light, and they're uh-huh. facing each other, looking longingly into each other's eyes, and then you see the end. Um, like the end card yes. of the show, and they cut it there. And so initially, I'm sure, I'm sure everybody hit you know their various you know forums of uh, of, <laughs> of choice. And so I know a lot of people online were like, "Well, that's kind of open ended." Blah blah blah. No, you know, that could be a very that's kind of open-ended. Like, like I heard, and like, then everybody. I heard so let's others. get to the best part of this entire thing that we're talking about. Let's talk about how. Brian and Mike, Bright, the creators, came out, and God bless it. them, mm-hmm. and definitively confirmed that yes, yes, they, they're, you know, they're a couple, that, that was supposed to mean that they decided to move from friendship to being a couple. Yeah. Thank and you for coming out and confirming that instead of letting all of these homophobic assholes run roughshod over this series. That Pretty just broke me insane. Hey, Nancy, tell us how you really yeah. feel. Well, I will true. always tell you how I really but she's feel. Right. It's but true, you're because this, right. cause this show, like, the greatest strength of, of not only Air, Avatar The Last Airbender, but Korra, is the fact that, like, it was so it's so progressive on so many fronts. I mean, oh. like, it was diverse, oh, yeah. diverse casting, and everybody got their, everybody yes. got a chance to shine. There was no like real favoritism even though Cora's the main character she was shown to be you know petulant she was shown to be not perfect you know she was a real person person. like there was like everything about this uh, about the show was just very real and authentic and like it you know you can see bits of your own life in in a lot of these things and it's you know that maybe sound you know cliche to say but it's true and like it was it was very progressive it it, it hit on a lot of very mature themes handled very very well and had a good message I mean it's just a fantastic show from start to finish and the, this ending is, is just is just more proof of that it's, we're in a progressive world and like and the fact that they show this on a cartoon show is very is, is pretty monumental um and it's oh, and it's, I'm huge. Pre- it's huge it's it should have been a articles long time that came out yeah. after this aired i oh, mean it's oh. proof like people are talking about it it's a big deal so and plus it really matters because when on top you of the say, fact that it's a great show in its own right uh, even without the ending like people oh, yeah. should be talking about it but Absolutely. this just launched it into the stratosphere well you know what's great I think is that they laid the groundwork they did it intentionally and then it happened organically and it just fits so well with the ending to the yeah. show it didn't feel forced. I think right. that was the best thing about it as well. I just, I, I mean, it's kind of like I wanted to. I couldn't decide if I was going to burst into tears or stand up and clap. Like, I stood probably up and clap. both. Yeah. I, I burst into tears, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I, you're, you're right, exactly right, Lance. Like, there's a lot of representation, or at least there's 
I mean, they don't look, like, I'm trying to think about it right now, but they did try to show, like, diversity for people of color in that <laughs> sense. you got dark Asians and light Asians and middle <laughs> right. well, Asians. Right, well, but I mean, it's all supposed to be an Asiatic society, right? So, right. We're, we're, I mean, they did the best they could, I think, on that front, but you're right. There are a lot of strong women, different kinds of women. Kuvira and Cora are very different kinds of strong women who have mm-hmm. flaws and I think that's what I liked a lot about this show in general yes. is everyone has a flaw and it doesn't mean that they're necessarily a bad person it just means that they're a person they're human. Yeah. and then also right. and, then, and then from the male side like the males were strong males without having to be like disrespectful oh. to the to the strong women yeah. like they didn't yes. take them for granted they, nor did they view them as anything other than that except you know, like, Haku but he changed <laughs> 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 and Sokka, but he changed. Yeah, but you, but yeah. you see what I'm getting at here. Yeah, like, it breaks, like, breaks a lot of societal stereotypes yeah. and gender yes. roles. Yeah, I agree. Like, you know, the males were allowed to be strong without feeling or, or needing to be shown as inferior. They just existed, like, and, and everybody existed. You know, that's that's what it should be. I Ooh. agree. Yeah, it, well, everyone was judged on their merits as well. There wasn't really any, like, oh, you're a woman, you can't do as much as me. Yeah. Or, oh, you're a man, you have to be overbearing and powerful. Like, there was yeah. never any of that, kind of, which is just great. But, I mean, man, I I was just surprised. I, I couldn't believe that they actually, like, more than hinted uh, I mean, at yeah, their relationship. I, I, just, I, I, watched, I watched this show, I actually just finished it, like, a couple hours ago. And, <laughs> um, and... <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, like three hours ago is when I finished the last episode. So, yeah. so I had seen all the not, not really the backlash. People, people when Bryke, I guess you called him, came out and mm-hmm. confirmed it. And I, but when I saw it, I was like, "This isn't any confirmation. This is so obvious. What's going on here?" I mean, if, yeah. if it was if it was a man and a woman, it wouldn't even need confirmation. I mean, it's it's so obvious the way mm-hmm. that they're sure. holding exactly. hands. And okay, holding hands is one thing, but then they look at each other. Come on. And I think, yeah. yeah. Yes, this exactly. is important that it's in in. Uh, you know, cartoon, and I'm hoping, and this is, I don't want to get too political here, but like in 10 years, the hope is that it's not a big thing. It's just a thing, right? Yeah, right. right. But I mean, sure. it, yeah. And obviously, for, obviously yeah. Uh, Travis. Yes. Oh, sorry. I thought you were going to say something. I was just going to say, I remember reading an article that I think, I think Brian was talking, and he was talking, they were asking about how did Nickelodeon feel about. You know this whole ending in this. Situation. I remember that article. Yeah, and I think he came out. And I remember him saying like they were actually very supportive and they never tried to stop it or stifle it or anything. Um, I suspect the only thing they told him not to do was for them to kiss. I think yeah. that's, that's what it was. I think it's the only guideline they gave him. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, they said, I mean, I don't know if that's right enough. The greatest Which thing is Which is great progress in itself. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. got to take baby steps. A kiss was, isn't really necessary anyway. I agree. I absolutely agree mm-hmm. with you. Plus, plus I don't, that's, how I they ended, wanna, that's how they also yep. ended Avatar The Last Airbender. Exactly. With the, yeah. with the guitar and yeah. Yeah. Right. And plus, you don't. You just don't need... You, they didn't need that. They they were already at that point. Mm-hmm. They yeah. didn't need to... Eat yeah. us over the head with their message. Exactly. Another <laughs> Boy, that's another thing the series did really well, was the right kind of touch at the right time. Yes. You know? They didn't, like, beat you over the head with stuff. Yeah, they actually treated time. their audience like you were smart, and mm-hmm. you understood well, what yeah, was going that. on. The relationship wasn't the, what defined them. I mean, Absolutely. that's a part of their life. Exactly. It was the same thing that yeah. defined each of them. Exactly. They had plenty of other, you know, traits and things about them. Right. Right. I agree. Yeah. I mean, it's just it was just kind of like we've been gushing about this entire series for like almost two hours now. But yeah. I mean, that really was just like the huge exclamation point at the end yeah. of a fantastic experience. Right. And in fact, why don't we why don't we just go around the table? Okay. And each give like a like a minute or so a th- final thought. Okay. Are we ready for that yet, guys? Yeah, sure. let's do it. Well, I'm ready for that. Let's start with let's go in, uh, in name order. So be uh, Lance, me, Nancy, Ace, and then finally Travis. So Lance, begin. Okay. Okay. Uh, so final thoughts on on the on this show and the other show, uh, Avatar: Last Airbender. Uh, it was just a fantastic experience from start to finish. Um, and I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed both. I have to, if if I had to pick one, uh, like the, that was oh, the, that no. I preferred, I would oh, have no. to say I'd have to say Cora, um, because I, I liked her her character better, I liked her arc better, and it's and the show was just better. And that's not a knock on Avatar: The Last Airbender, but I just seemed to, it, it just kind of hit me at the right time, and I'm in the right stage of life to really kind of appreciate what's going on there. Uh, but both are fantastic. Uh, Brian and Mike did a fantastic job. I can't wait to meet them at a con sometime uh, so I can shake. 
shake their hand and tell them how much I appreciate uh, the work they did on this. Avatar idea. Oh yeah, oh, and and if they ever continue the next Avatar, um, it, like you know the, the Avatar cycle, the next Avatar is going to be an Earthbender. Why not it be a black Avatar? You know, in the seventies time or something, and he could be the Negro Tar. Uh, <laughs> that's that's my yeah, yeah. That's, that's my pitch. So, um, I. My, my final thoughts are, you know what, what I love I love the last Airbender, and I was so excited when I heard they were making a second series, and I didn't get to watch it for a few years, and I'm really excited I finally got to. One thing I, I want to mention that I truly love is that this was not a boy show or a girl show. I mean, mm-hmm. even as me, as if I can imagine myself 20 years ago as a young kid, I would not be uncomfortable or feel stupid playing with Cora because... She was a badass. She was a badass. Mm-hmm. And in fact, every one of them badass. Even Asami, who didn't have any bidding, she was awesome for in her own way because she was smart and she could invent and she could shock the shit out of you with her hand. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, lo- I love the way it went. I love the way um, that she learned. Uh, I think I mentioned this several times. She learned from her enemies and became a better person for it. And I think at the end of the series, she's just, she be- she's become a mature and adult, someone who's ready to lead. Uh, apparently with a sobby by her side, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, me. Um, I I guess especially with just overall how progressive both shows really were, but especially Korra, um, I hope that it sets a precedent for shows in general, but especially animated shows or shows that kids would see, because there are... Um, I think it's cool that maybe if you were a kid watching this show, um, seeing Korra end up, you know, the hero always gets the girl. Ha ha ha. The Avatar always but gets the girl. Avatar Rose always gets the girl. He did. And sure. I think it's important. I mean, representation, we've talked about it before on the podcast, is really important. And it's important for kids to see themselves and the kind of people that they are in the things that they consume. And I think that this is just really cool for kids in general because it doesn't matter and I'm getting on my own personal political soapbox. I'm not talking for anybody else, but it doesn't matter, and it shouldn't, who you love. It just matters that you're two people that love each other. So that's all I'll say on that. I would also pick Korra as my more favorite of the series, although there are moments in the first series that are really dear to me, but I would still have to go with Korra for most of the same reasons Lance listed. I think I was just in the right place at the right time um, in my life for it to really mean something to me. I incorporate the things that I love into my life in a big way. That's like my obsessive nerd shade. And I definitely feel as though I have learned perspectives and attitudes from experiencing Avatar in general that hopefully I would like to think hopefully make me a better person. I mean, I think it's good enough that it could do that. I think it had so many lessons to teach without ever being preachy. I I think that's incredible, and it's such a hard thing to accomplish. So that's all I feel about that. Next, Ace. My next. Uh, You're next. Yours. So next. Uh, <laughs> both. Yes. For me, both shows get A plus plus. I mm-hmm. put them in the hall of some, you know, TV hall of fame somewhere. They both deserve to go. And the simple fact that it wasn't necessarily the story about our heroes. It was a story about people, mm-hmm. and that's that's what really set it apart and set it above. Um, I, I I felt Lance recommended this show, the, the original show to me years ago, and I went and found it on Netflix while it was still there and fell in love and watched all of them in a row. Just not, I couldn't stop watching. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, just as I finished that is when Legend of Korra is uh, wrapping up its first book. And so I got on all that media. There are comics of the show as continuation of um, The Last Airbender that are I got them. Yep. available from purchase from Dark Horse Comics. Um, there are also a couple Avatar video games. There is a uh, release by Platinum of the Legend of Korra game, which was phenomenal. It was very, very fun to play. Um, I kind of want to mention how Nickelodeon handled the show, but I'm not sure if I have time because it was a whole thing. It was and terrible. It really sucked. I understand from a business perspective why they did it. That doesn't make it any less sucky, but I can, I'll, I've, I've gone over my time to mm-hmm. speak on it, so I will concede the baton. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's me. I think I'm just going to echo everybody else's statements that this show is a hot piece of garbage. It's pretty much <laughs> a perfect show. No, 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 you're thinking about the movie. 
M. Night Shyamalan, no, I'm, M. Night Shyamalan is the greatest director of our time. Um, he should do every movie from here on out. Uh, but no, I, I, I remember thinking when the first original Avatar uh, show concluded that it, thinking it was like one of the perfect series from beginning to end, the way it started, especially the way it ended. I don't think you could have handled a show any better they handled that entire series like from the character perfect almost like perfect storytelling through and through um I, I say that but I also enjoyed Korra um I guess I do like the original series better but in certain ways it's, it's so hard I, I can't I don't really want to have to pick between the two they're both well, fantastic this tile do you like better uh, yeah exactly uh, yeah. you don't want to pick um it's fantastic I, I guess I know people probably want them to make another show, and I like Lance, your and Ace's idea of what the next show oh, could be. Oh, will drive me into this. Oh, okay, sorry. It's all Lance's idea. Um, but I, to me, I feel like they should just leave it how it is. I feel the longer you... Well, they've I, also... I feel like the problem of media in general is they don't know when to stop a story and move on to something different. They just keep on dragging it out. I think they should just stop it here. It's perfect the way it is. Everything is amazing. Leave it in your mind as this most amazing thing you've seen in, in like a really long time or forever, and, and this is the memory you'll have forever. I think they should just stop and move on to something else. Agreed. Yeah, the creators have said they want to move on as well, and as as yeah, much the, as it pains me as a fan to hear that, I respect that decision. Rather than you know watch you know the twenty eighth season of Avatar. Yeah, and it's kind of just going through the motions it's, it's now. It's diminishing returns at some point. Like, yeah, exactly. You don't want to go out on a high note. You don't want to that. return and have it be slow. Well, they haven't heard the idea for Black Guitar yet, so... That's true. They might want to put that in. <laughs> Although they, Bright did say that there would be Korra comics, so excite! Ooh, is that is that legit? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's legit. Okay, awesome. Woo! <laughs> well, I think Ooh, that we had a great discussion about Legend of Korra. What, what do you think, guys? I think so, too. So. You know, it's, it was, it's, it's kind of hard going. Like, it's obvious that we all love this very much, and, and we love the subject matters very much. And it's it's kind of hard to kind of get high points on, on some of this because there's so many specific things that we true, all wanted true, to talk true. about. Uh, but I guess the main recommendation, I guess, from this from this panel and this podcast is for those of you who have not watched the show, do it. go watch the show and you'll understand how difficult it was for us to do this podcast today and to talk around things instead of really <laughs> delving into it. Right. Uh, but you'll appreciate our, our, our love for the show and, and, our, um, and our affection for it. Uh, so that's the, basically the, the biggest takeaway you should get from this podcast. Um, I have yet to meet any person that has watched this show and was like, meh, or nah, I didn't really <laughs> like it. Unfortunately, they exist, but we yeah, don't know what the end. They're I, just I, bad people. And yeah, that's at the end of that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. We don't like to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. So I guess on that note, uh, thank you all for tuning in to this edition of uh, Nerds Explain It All. Uh, if you wanted to get in contact with us you can send us an email at nerdsexplainedall at gmail.com or you can find us on twitter at nerdsexplain uh, so I guess for this episode I'm Lance I'm Steven I'm Nancy and special thanks uh, again to Travis and Ace for joining us on this edition of the podcast thanks for having us yeah thank you yes Woo. thank you very much all right, so I guess we'll see you guys at our uh, with our next, and we'll we'll be talking to you in our next episode of Nerds Explained Out. Thank you again for listening. And don't forget, guys, we may not break the news, but we do break it down. Gonna break it down, break it down, break it down. <laughs> First, can I say, I think it goes without saying that we all let M. Night Shyamalan here. Uh, no. What, is that, I will pick you off of that. Wait, hold on. I finally just looked at your picture, and I have that shirt. What shirt am I wearing? It's black. It's got a white, white and red stripes. Oh, that's a nice shirt. That polo shirt? <laughs> yeah. I like that shirt. I like that shirt. Shirt goes hard. It's I'm so favorites. glad that we're having this conversation. <laughs> all right, now. Polo shirts? <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
So we're on Polo Caps. We're, and we're, today we're going to talk about <laughs> Jersey Knit versus the Polo Knit. Now, I'm a Jersey <laughs> fan myself. <laughs> and is Ralph Lauren worth the money? Oh, my God, no. Every oh. every year, my my in-laws get me Ralph Lauren a shirts. Shirt? And it's like $90 for Polo. And so I go take it back, and I get the... I get like I try to find something 